Okay, second last question on the paper. Question 9, 13 marks. This is a big one. Okay, students have designed and carried out an experiment. It's an experimental question. So therefore, looking at this, there is a massive amount of reading involved in this one. Um, this is a good one to have a quick look through on your um, reading time, I would say. But let's have a look at this. Um, the investigation was to find out something about tartaric acid, which is here by the looks of it, that was bought commercially is 99% pure as claimed by the manufacturer. So we want to find out if it's true. The experiment involved titrating. So we're doing a titration of that with sodium hydroxide and calculating percentage purity and comparing the commerce, comparing the experimental value with the manufacturer's stated value. Here is part of the report. Um, this is tartaric acid. Very nice introduction to give us a bit of a detail about the chemical involved. One thing to note, we have two carboxyl groups, so therefore we're going to be adding in two NaOHs, hopefully. Um, and the equation is here as well, which is good. Um, aim, that's fair enough. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to this once I actually read the questions. Okay, um, some results here, which looks all good. Let's look at the question. So name the independent variable in this experiment. All right, this is a titration. So independent variable is the thing that I vary. So am I changing anything in this experiment? So what am I doing? I'm doing a titration. I, this does not, um, a titration does not have an independent variable because you're not using different types of um, tartaric acid. We're using the same commercial tartaric acid. So in this case, um, I'm going to say this titration. I'm not going to say a titration. I'm going to say this titration. Because technically, you could do titrations on a number of different um, commercial samples. And that would mean your commercial sample would be um, the independent variable. But this one, we're not. We're actually just taking the same stuff over and over again. So therefore, we're not changing anything. So that means it does not have an independent variable. Alrighty, moving on, that's a bit weird. But identify a controlled variable in this experiment and state why it's important for this input variable to be controlled. So let's have a look at what they've done in the method and find something that they've done each time. So um, we've purchased the powder, we've prepared the solution by accurately weighing 30 grams of powder. We're only doing that once really, all this preparation is just once. Titration, we're repeating over and over, so this is where the control comes into it. We've got a stock solution of that, so that's controlled. Um, so here for your, your concentration of sodium hydroxide, that's a controlled measurement. Your aliquots, this is a controlled variable, so therefore the, your, your volume of your aliquot has to be the same each time, they're, they're stating that. We're adding four drops of phenylphthalein indicator. That's also controlled. So that's one, that's two, that's three. Um, we're titrating out till a permanent pink color remains. Look, I'm just going to pick one of these. I'm going to pick um, the aliquot. We have used the same size, which is 10.00 mil aliquot. All right, why does this need to be controlled? So why is it important? Because um, this, so dot point for one mark, dot point for two marks, this means that we take the same amount of um, acid solution, acid solution each time and the titers can be um, compared slash averaged all right so that's why so stating why it's important um, same deal really for having the same concentration of sodium hydroxide we want to make sure it's consistent. It's a valid method. Um, this one's probably not a bad idea as well. The, the four drops of phenylphthalein, um, 
Adding the same amount of phenylphthalein means we get the same color. So that's probably not a bad one to use as well for that question, but I've already written my answer, so I'm not gonna do that again. Moving on. Is this is the value the student used for the average tidying calculations section appropriate? Explain your reasoning. So if you're calculating average, we need to have concordant titers. So let's check to see what they've done here. Um, average titer, we've used, well, we've got five trials, but we've only used three, so that's a good start. Um, 0 0.81, 0 0.76, 0 0.75. That means they're all within 0 0.1 mil of each other. So that's pretty good to me. Um, they've taken out this outlier. So that's all good, so um, yes, um, it is, do they say appropriate or valid? They say appropriate, appropriate as they have used concordant titers, which are um, plus or minus 0 0.5 mil, um, sorry, 0 point not. 0 0.5, 0 plus, eh, plus or minus 0 0.05 mil. So it's just me giving an understanding um, as to what concordant means. If I can define concordant, um, that's even better with a value. So I'm going to put that in there as well. So that's good. Um, moving on. Consider the method undertaken by the student in this experiment to determine the percentage purity of the powder. Identify how specific steps, I need to pick out steps here, affect the accuracy and reliability. So I'm going to talk about a step that does accuracy and I'm going to talk about a step that does reliability. So let's have a look at my method again. Um, what do we got here? Um, accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. I want to make sure that we get close to the original value as possible. Um, my suggestion with accuracy is the fact that step three, anytime we actually have to visually see something, it's not going to be super duper accurate um, because our perception of color is going to be different. So I'm going to say um, step three. Because it asks for specific steps, I'm going to put step three. Um, the looking for a per Permanent pink color is not very accurate as um, people will have different perceptions of color. So that's where I think that comes into it, so we're not being accurate, we're not being close to our value as we possibly could. We could try and change that up by using a pH meter, perhaps. Um, that could be better. And for the next one, what is reliability? It's about repeating um, something until you have, I guess, results which are pretty similar. So therefore, step five is all about the repetition. So again, reliability, repetition, so step five, um, repeating, repeating the titration will improve the reliability, reliability of the students' results. Um, and again, so I've highlighted repeating, and for you why, I've got four marks, probably two marks in here, two marks in here. I've gone against my rule about putting four dot points down, but I can clearly see that um, that's really a dot point coming in here as, moving on. Um, identify a limitation. So what's wrong with the student's conclusion and how this limitation could be addressed. So what is our, Students' conclusion. 
students' conclusion, through direct titration of tartaric acid with sodium hydroxide, the percentage purity of the commercial supply of tartaric acid was found to be 92.5%. That's what they found, which is good. Um, this is less than the stated value. Consequently, the manufacturer's claim is wrong. All right, so they've, they've gone out of limb and they've gone and said that um, through my test, uh, the manufacturer is wrong. They are a student of chemistry. Are they right or are they um, perhaps, is their method per perfect? Um, is it better than the manufacturers of our tartaric acid? I would suggest that um, this is one student's results and perhaps maybe they might need to do a bit more testing. So their limitation of this conclusion is the fact that it is only one student's results um, and that four, how can this be addressed? Um, it can be addressed by um, taking the average of the whole class or at least sorry at least taking a number of different samples of acid all right because if you look at their method here if you think back to this what they did is they made up an acid solution with just one sample of powder and they didn't, um, so that is one, whilst they've repeated their titration here, they've repeated their titration, they haven't repeatedly got different samples of powder, so therefore it's not as, perhaps not as uh, valid or it is limited, their, their method's limited anyway. All right, moving on. Uh, the, the MSDS for tartaric acid um, powder includes the following statement. Warning, this product causes eye and skin and respiratory tract irritation. Apart from a lab coat, what other PPE should be used in each student's situations? Preparing this solution and conducting this titration. So when preparing this solution, they're using very concentrated acid. Um, when they're doing the titration, it's diluted. Um, that's one thing to think about here. So if you look at this, they're, they're using the full-on using the full-on powder um, here and then when they're here they're using um, the diluted amount so my suggestion when you're doing that if you've ever made esters in your class um, you've probably come in contact with some pretty strong acids um, there you'd want to do this in a fume hood um, use a fume hood um, that also deals with this the fact that if you're using a fume hood, you're probably not going to breathe it in, which is quite a good there as well. So use a fume hood, use a breathing apparatus um, when you're actually preparing this thing here. If you're doing a titration, nothing really bad you need to use other than perhaps gloves um, to deal with the skin and of course it's eye um, slash goggles. Goggles, not Googles. Goggles would be good. Um, safety safety goggles rather than just swimming goggles um, so that's where I think our marks are going to come from here um, preparing that definitely using a fume hood because you're using a concentrated acid in a titration gloves and safety goggles would be enough for your two marks and that's it um, one question left after this